And welcome to another podcast of Jono Talks. Today I have Joshua Galbraith in the studio again. I think I had him, I think I had him on a few or more than a couple of weeks ago when the Australian Open was about to start. Um, so that was literally a day before the first week began. Um, and so now I've got him on again because I thought it'd be a good chance to review the Australian Open as a whole, both from like a ball squad perspective and um, a player's perspective, like how the tournament actually went. So thanks, Josh, for coming by again. No worries, mate. Good to be here. Absolutely. And um, so what did you think about the eventual winner uh, in the male side, uh, Novak Djokovic? Uh, he's won it six times. Um, did you think anyone else had a chance against him? No, nah, unfortunately not. I think from the early rounds, it looked like it was going to be Novak and Andy in the final again. But I think Novak's just going to be too good for the fi- in the final. Um, it's going to be hard to beat in the next couple of years, I think, as well. Yeah. Did you get that sense of, like, um, deja vu when you saw Andy Murray and Novak Djokovic in the final? Because I remember for your last match in the Australian Open, you um, officiated the as a ball boy from, like, when it was Andy Murray and Novak Djokovic. Did that bring you back any memories? Yeah, it certainly did. Yeah. I think <laughs> this is now the third time, at the least, that those two have played off yeah. in the singles final. Um, Unfortunately, Andy's been to five Australian Open finals and hasn't quite come through yet, but uh, hopefully he might get one in the next couple of years. Mm. And, you know, I, I was rooting for Roger Federer, admittedly. Like, who wouldn't be? Um, I was surprised when I was watching the first, sh- uh, first set between Novak and Roger, because Novak literally blew him out of the park in, like, the first set, 6-1, and he was literally outplaying him, and Roger didn't do too much wrong throughout the whole tournament. <laughs> yeah, as Roger does, Roger just gets through, gets by. Uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that first set of that match didn't quite go his way. Uh, Novak was playing pretty well, but, um, yeah, I think Roger's just a step back from those two, Novak and Andy, at the moment, but hopefully before the end of his career, he can break through for another title, and... Uh, get back to that top of the top of the tree. Yeah, the only unfortunate thing is that at the moment I think he's got an injury. Uh, yeah. He's sustained an injury. Uh, he's starting to get a bit old, Roger. His body's <laughs> starting to fail him a bit, but hopefully he can hang on for a little bit longer. Uh-huh. Um, and with those top players, like, is it a big thrill for the ball boys and ball girls when you know they're kind of um, beside, you know, not just top players, but you know, this era of tennis? you know, Novak, Nadal and Roger, those three, you know, they, they could lay claims to be, you know, top five, top ten, like, of any time. So is it a big thrill for the ball squad when they have those sort of players? Yeah, on court? it certainly is. I think in my role as a supervisor, there's probably nothing better than seeing a kid walking out onto centre court for the first time. And more often than not, when you're walking out into centre court, it's, it's your yeah, ball kidding for Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, even a late into its last match or... Um, some of the big female players, Sharapova, Serena Williams. So there's nothing better than seeing the kid walking out for the first time for a match like that. So yeah, it certainly is a thrill. And is it hard not to be distracted though? Say if you're on Rod Laver Arena and the crowd, I'm not sure how old, how much it carries, but I've been there. The atmosphere can get pretty electric. Yeah, you know? the atmosphere in stadiums like that is pretty amazing. Yeah. And yeah, big matches, big players, it is kind of hard for kids to concentrate at times. Um, particularly for the Australian matches, Australian players in the first couple of days, particularly when you have the fanatics around. There's 15,000 people in the stadium cheering on an Australian player, and when they start to do well, the crowd can get really intense and really loud, and yeah, it can be hard hard to concentrate. But that's why we train our kids so hard, and they know that they do their job and they do it well, and that's why they're on centre court in the first place. Because mm-hmm. you know, especially with uh, how do you decide? Because obviously, the w- the difference between the women's game and the men's game is that the men's game can go across five sets, whereas the maximum for the women's game is three sets. Um, do you? How do you allocate um, who should, what kind of ball boy or ball girl should manage the three set match or the five set match? Sort of. It doesn't really matter. Like, it depends what ki- uh, what kids we put on each court. So. It doesn't matter whether they're five set or three set matches, they just go on one call for the day. And whether they do men's matches, women's matches, doubles matches, singles matches, it doesn't really matter as long as they're all capable of doing the job. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't really change depending on what sort of gender the players are or what um, format of the game they're playing. So that's not really an issue. Because mm-hmm. the reason why I asked was because I was just wondering do you, is there an, um, a moment? 
where like a ball boy or a ball girl has to do not just one match but two in a day. Is that, yeah, is that yeah. possible? Yeah, they they could do four matches in a day. Like oh, wow. they'll be on a court for a day, so we just start at eleven o'clock in the morning. Um, and those courts tend to have four or five matches on them each. Um, so they'll probably do at least two, maybe three, before being taken over in the afternoon. Um, and then the afternoon squad might do one or two as well. Uh, so, yeah, they'll definitely do more than one match in a day. And then obviously we'll have a night squad come in and do the night session. Um, so, yeah, they'll tend to do at least two matches a day, if not maybe three, depending on how quick they go. So what happens if a five-set match goes for in excess of, like, four and a half hours or something? Does that alter? Because... Obviously, you don't know when a tennis match is going to end. You know, it can end at any time. Same with the women's. I mean, you know, we saw that with the final with Serena Williams. And who's the other player? Uh, Kerber. Angela Kerber. Kerber. That was an amazing, ma- amazing yeah. match. Um, but, you know, well, that was a final. But if it was, say, like a week one where you don't know, there's so many matches going on and you don't know when they're finishing, is that hard to coordinate as, like, a ball squad manager? Yeah, it certainly is. The, uh, when is the tennis match going to finish is probably the uh, hardest question in the ball kid uh, squad. Um, and it certainly goes unanswered pretty much every single time. But um, yeah, but the long matches and the long days are certainly the hardest um, to coordinate. Um, our kids are starting to understand that yeah, we, can't un- we don't know when the tennis match is going to finish. Um, and there's certainly plenty of instances where you think it's going to finish and then all of a sudden it goes for another hour. Um, but yeah, the reality is that's the way tennis goes and uh, yeah, there's going to be long days in there, but yeah, we work around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so would you say then that week one is the hardest part of the job that you're in? Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, definitely is. Um, the first probably four days of main draw and also the qualifying week are probably the most challenging because there's so many matches to play it seemed as though the weather was as hot as the whole tournament in those four days um, and the crowds are the biggest in those four days as well. So yeah, it's certainly a busy time. Um, we have the most kids on uh, working as well in those sort of four days because obviously there's more matches to, uh, to service, uh, it's early in the tournament, it's exciting. So yeah, it's certainly uh, a busy few days early on in the tournament, no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. And how do you, um, do you supervise every um like in your role, uh, because I assume yeah you have like multiple people in that role. Do you, do all of you go on a particular court and see what's actually happening? Yeah, so we have uh, staff pretty much on just about every court, if not one one staff covering two courts. So yeah, um, we make sure we watch all the kids pretty much every day um, and look after their health and stuff. So make sure we're there if anything happens. Um, so yeah, we pretty much cover every court. Uh, every day, so it's pretty good. Is there like an ambition of yours though, if you had to pick every time, would it be Rod Laver Arena? Yeah, certainly, yeah. everyone wants to be out <laughs> on the centre court. Um, same with the kids, we always want to be out there as well. Um, it's where the big matches happen, big crowds, big atmosphere, so there's certainly nothing better than being out there on the Rod Laver Arena. Mm. Because sometimes, say in the first week, uh, in my opinion, you can get better matches than on Rod Laver Arena. Uh, that's just my opinion. For instance, um, you know, say not like the like the top ten players. Say, uh, you know, you could get say like a Gaia Monfils who doesn't really play on Rod Laver from memory. What what court does he play on? Uh, he's he a uh, show court in my sense. Um, I mean, if you got to yeah. see him in a show court, yeah, I mean, a ground pass ticket gets you in the show court too, or whatever. Where um, Monfils probably plays early in the tournament. Um, yeah, he's one of the more freakish people uh, if you'll see on the tennis circuit. No doubt about that. Yeah, because I remember um, you discussing how you were present at the Gilles Simon and Gail Monfils match when how, uh, they went over four hours. Yeah. He's just such an athlete and he had an awesome Australian Open 2016. Uh, did he make the quarters? Uh, or just before that? Yeah, not sure he quite made the quarters, but he was, yeah, he had a pretty good tournament. Mm. Um, so, who was your favourite player to watch live? Uh, I don't think it's much better than watching Leighton, especially in Australia. Um, out on centre court, he uh, he loves the atmosphere. 
and thrives on the atmosphere, I think, and that's what's made him such a good player over the last 20 years. Uh, and watching his, um, after he beat beaten in the double, uh, in singles, playing doubles with Sam Croft, uh, you could see he was genuinely loving being out there and being out there playing tennis. And I think that's what the Australians have loved about watching Leighton in the last 20 years. Yeah, because some people thought after he lost the um, singles match to uh, David Ferrer, uh, an awesome uh, tennis player from Spain, uh, that his career was finished, but he was still doing like a doubles match with uh, Sam Groth. Yeah, he played in the doubles with Sam Groth, and yeah, as I said, he genuinely loved it, the atmosphere. I think it was on High Sense Arena, his first round doubles match. And um, you could see them bouncing off each other, just loving what they were doing. And, it was a fairly, it was a fairly close match. Can't remember the exact score, but it was uh, might have been a th third set actually, um, and it was quite a long match. And they ended up getting up and winning it. And then unfortunately, I think they got beaten the next round of the doubles by, I think it might have been the eventual champions. But um, yeah, watching Leighton and Sam Groth that night on high sense was yeah pretty special. I think for everyone in there. So um, were you present at that match? No, I wish I was. Yeah. Unfortunately, I wasn't. <laughs> but I was watching on TV and cheering them on. But yeah. It was certainly good to watch. Yeah, and that's another thing as well, you know, Sam Goff is a huge server. I mean, his serve speed, you know, reaches, you know, 210 kilometers per hour over. And, you know, with the ball boys and ball girls, if they're facing someone like a Raonic or a Sam Groth or a Ivo Karlovic or a John Isner, like, is that, can that be a bit scary sometimes when the ball is coming kind of towards you, not towards you, but almost towards you at such an insane speed. Yeah, it's frightening. Um, I can tell you from experience, but um, I'm sure most people probably saw last year the uh, kid who got hit in the uh, in the groin. Um, I think that was Feliciano Lopez maybe who hit him. And a tennis ball certainly doesn't hurt, uh, sorry, does hurt when you get hit at that pace. So yeah, it's certainly frightening, especially on the uh, smaller courts when there's not as much distance between the server and the ball kid. But, yeah, our reaction, the reaction times have been pretty good, so they mm. get themselves out of the way more often than not. So what would the, like for instance, who would be the fastest server that you've been um, on court with? It's probably a tough tough one to pick between Milos Raonic and Sandra. Uh -huh. uh, they're both pretty quick, up around the 220, 230 plus. Um, so yeah. what did it feel like when, when like the like I don't, a ball would just come towards yeah. you? You know, not much reaction time at all. Frightening. You're just hoping that the player in front of you hits it, otherwise you're in trouble. But um, yeah, it was pretty frightening. I could imagine it's like I don't know, saying cricket. You know, you're facing an extremely fast bowler. Yeah. <laughs> Way. It's like facing Brett Lee in the middle of the MCG. It's pretty frightening, but yeah, you get yourself out of the way more often than not. Uh huh. Um. And so, what did you think of uh, Milos Raonic's uh, tournament? You know, I think he should have made the finals. Uh, yeah, it was pretty impressive. Um, you know, and that was that was a player that everyone was like, okay, he's going to take the next step. And he's got the game, he's got the serve, he's got the power. Um, he, his ground stroke seems to have improved. Yeah. His movement, everything. Do you think he'll break into um, that, you know, top five in the future? Without any shadow of a doubt, he will. Um, if he was probably a bit unlucky, obviously he ran into Andy Murray in the semi-final, but he's going to be something pretty, pretty good in the not too distant future, and I think it's going to be good for a long time. So um, Canadian tennis is going to go pretty well, I reckon, the next ten years with him and uh, Eugenie Bouchard yes. and Straw. So yeah, he's going to be something pretty good, no doubt. Yeah, Eugenie Bouchard, um, who you just mentioned, yeah, she's such a fan favourite at the Australian Open. Like she's yeah. got the uh, the genie army. Yeah, in the so, stand. Uh, I was there that night when she played um, Agnieszka Radvanska, round two, and the Genie Army were present. They were uh, sitting up behind me. Um, certainly loud, and that's sort of what we were talking about before, with kids getting distracted by the atmosphere in the crowds. It's sort of group like that that um, can throw their concentration a bit, but um, yeah, they certainly did very well that night as well. With the Genie Army though, uh, some of them you know, are Australians, aren't they? They're all Australians. Yeah, yeah, they're all Australians, yeah, yeah. so you don't really... They found her, I think, two and a half years ago now, um, just on one of the back courts. She got through round one, and then she continued to go through. She had a really good run that year. I think she might have, might have made the semi-finals, and they followed her right through the tournament and followed her ever since. Yeah, and what... Uh, did she do well in this Australian Open? 
Nah, she got beat in the second round, but she came up against the world number four, Agnieszka Radvanska, so she was oh. a bit unlucky with the draw, but um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the thing about the Australian Open. Uh, some people can, you know, just like from a mutual observer perspective, they can forget that the draw um, can play a massive part in the success of a player. For instance, um, Bernard Tomic uh, from Australia, I think he was born in Germany though, uh, he um, had quite an easy draw, I think, yeah, in the first week. Draw. Yeah, and he eventually got beaten by um, Murray. Yeah. Um, you know, and I kind of wanted, to, I know Murray's like an awesome player, but I kind of wanted to see Tommy do a bit better, just for Australian yeah, tennis in general. It was a bit disappointing. <clears throat> a bit disappointing, but he's still only 22 or 3, I think, so he's got plenty of, plenty of tennis ahead of him, and it's going to be good. He's starting to come good in the last couple of years, or the last 12 months particularly, and uh, I don't think it'll be long before he breaks through the top 10. Mm, who do you think is going to break into the top 10 first, Curios or uh, Tomic? Tomic, for sure. Mm. Pretty confident about that too. Well, well, why do you think that? I think he's starting to get himself a bit together a bit quicker. Um, he's, he's a couple of years older than Nick, but I think he's starting to get himself a bit quicker. Uh, himself together a bit quicker and is starting to play much better tennis, much more consistent. Mm. Um, Nick's got all the game and all, all the shots and stuff, but he just probably goes for too many shots that probably aren't there. Um, but yeah, I think Bernie's reined himself in a bit and he's going to be a good player in the very, very short future. Yeah, and that's a good point you raise. Like, you know, Kuros has got, you know, if, you, if you're going to see a match between either Curios or Tomic, you'd probably watch Curios because he, he he's got the he's got the entertainment yeah, factor. Nick's definitely must watch television every time he steps onto the court because you'd never know what he could do. Yeah, he's got a he's got a rocket serve. Uh, he's got he just slams the ball, you know, forehand, backhand. He's got immense power. Like I, I've seen, you know, Roger Federer and um, Novak Djokovic just in interviews and stuff. They say, oh yeah, you know, Curios. You know, he, he's a special talent. Yeah, he could definitely be absolutely anything if he wanted to be. And I hope that he realises that potential and realises it pretty quick because, yeah, he could be one of the best we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we've also had some, you know, uh, good Australian tennis players in the past, but because we've only really had Hewitt, you know, taking the mantle and he's gotten a bit older, like, you know, we've got these young players now who, actually, who hopefully can, you know, start playing a bit better. We also have uh, Kokianakis, who some people have forgotten because he didn't play the play at the Australian Open due to injury. Um, have you been following his career closely? Yeah, Thanasi's going to be another good player. I think he's, again, a bit younger, or slightly younger maybe than Nick. Um, and he's a fair bit back now after not playing in Melbourne. But he's going to be a, it's going to be a fairly, uh, fairly dangerous trio, those three, um, in the Davis Cup uh, for the next few years, hopefully. Um, obviously, that's that's on in about three weeks, three or, four, or three weeks time. I think we play. I think it's the United States here in Melbourne. Um, that's going to be big for Australia. Hopefully, we can get get over the line there and progress through to the next round. But um, that trio, Kyrgios, Kokonakis, and Tomic, um, it's going to be uh, one of our best probably in the last whoever knows since Leighton Hewitt. Oh, sorry, before Leighton Hewitt, really hadn't had much. Um, but yeah, that three. That trio is going to be pretty dangerous, I think, for a long time to come. Mm, and especially, I can't wait for that Davis Cup tie between America and Australia. I think they're playing at um, Kuyong. Yeah, back on the grass at Kuyong, back in the old days. It's vintage Australian Open, back in before Melbourne Park, um, on the grass at Kuyong. So I think there's plenty of people who are very, very excited about that. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be good for Australian tennis to get back on to Kuyong for the first time in a long time. Mm. Um, and hopefully it'll bring big crowds and a good atmosphere into the stadium. Mm. The only thing is that, yeah, America... Oh, like, what, what kind of... Who's the top, um, who's the top player? Uh, John Isner are probably the top player, and the second player in the singles will be Jack Sock, who also is a good, young, up-and-coming player. So it's going to be a good tie. Um, but as I think, hopefully, on the home court, home uh, home crowd, hopefully they'll get us over the line. Mm -hmm. And do you think... Um, that especially uh, on grass we may have the advantage because I know uh, Curios did especially well at Wimbledon. Obviously the courts are not quite the same but in terms of speed the grass tends to be a bit quicker um, and Tomich I think prefer prefers grass. He had that awesome run in Wimbledon when he was really young. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, against and then he went against Novak, and then he got and then he bundled out of the tournament. But um, do you think we have an advantage, not just on the because it's in our home country, but the actual court itself? Yeah, no doubt. Both Kyrgios and Tommy have had yeah, they said pretty good runs at Wimbledon in the last sort of three years or so. Um, and they both obviously play very well on grass. I'm not so sure about Isner and Sock, um, but hopefully yeah, the grass will get us over the line as well. But um, between the two of them, hopefully we can get the job done. Mm -hmm. And Kuyong Classic, um, isn't the main court a hard court though? Yeah, but they're changing it to grass court for the Davis Cup. So, ah. um, I think that's been done, or is in the process of being done. Um, so come March the 5th, I think it is, or March the 4th, something like that. It'll be ready to go for the Davis Cup on grass. That that's awesome, yeah. Especially at the fact that it's at Kuyong, um, is quite cool. I, I I've been to like plenty of, plenty of old memories for some people. There's no doubt about that. And mm. uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting for Australian tennis. Yeah, especially you know Kuyong Classic. I mean, it's not as important as the Australian Open, but I've been to both, and I remember the Kuyong Classic. You can get more um, more of an intimate experience with the players because you can go kind of closer. Um, stands wise like even like the furthest and I'm talking about like kind of the main court even the furthest one uh, furthest seats away you still have a good view and yeah, it was a good little stadium cool. yeah and I um, I actually managed to get um, Songa's signature yeah I think he was playing Tommy Haas from, um, from Germany and uh, you know how people, they just, you know, at the Australian Open when a match finishes, they ask for like the place next to they just hold out something. At Kuyong Classic, I'll give you a tip, uh, you, you'd be able to have a, a lot better chance if you just go up, because um, it's such a small stadium, that's what makes it really good. The atmosphere is awesome and, um, you know, and everyone's close together. And with the Davis Cup tie especially, there's a different atmosphere involved. It's not like the yeah. Australian Open. I mean, it can get really, you know, like in terms of applause and everything, you know. Um, probably, so, probably a bit rowdier the Davis Cup. Yeah, because they, cause they in between points even, you know. Yeah, that, watching that can, overseas, some of the Davis Cup ties in Australia played there recently. I think I watched the one we played against um, Great Britain with Andy and Jamie Murray, and that was as rowdy as I've seen. That was like watching a... English Premier League soccer match, but um, yeah, the Davis Cup crowds and even the Fed Cup crowds can get pretty rowdy. You know, they get get behind their country, get behind their team, um, and I'm no doubt that the Australian crowd will get behind the Aussies against the States in a couple of weeks. Mm, because you see, like, uh, um, where with Australia's coach, uh, it's not it's not Pat Rafter anymore, but um, uh, Pat Davis Cup captain now is Leighton Hewitt. It's taken over, so it's exciting again for Australian tennis that we've got Leighton um, still involved. Um, hopefully you can guide the team to victory. Mm, because you see, like, you know, sometimes they, they're just, like, on court and, you know, they're reporting their, you know, players. Yeah. It's like, come on, come on. It's really quite um, a unique experience, you know, because it's not just the two players. It's, you know, you've got your support, like, on court. Yeah. It's a unique, um, unique way of doing, a unique way of playing tennis. But I think it's a refreshing way of playing tennis and it's a way that um, certainly has worked for a long time and... Hopefully it'll work for a long time to come, and hopefully in the next couple of years, Leighton might be the captain of a Davis Cup winning Australian team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, we're, like you said before, we've got the team for it, uh, the, and especially the fact that they're young. You know, yeah, like certainly hope... building a team for the future. There's no doubt about that. Mm. Um, who do you think has the best Davis Cup, uh, Davis Cup team though at the moment? Uh, it's probably dependent on uh, which players play. But I think it's hard to go past, say, Novak Djokovic in Serbia, um, Roger Federer, Switzerland, even Nadal in Spain with Zadasko as well, who knocked him out of the Australian Open. But of course, that's dependent probably on the uh, surface. So there's plenty of good teams around. Um, we're going to be good again, no doubt about that. Um, Great Britain won last year. They beat us in the semi final and went on to win the final. So they're obviously going to be good again with Andy Murray uh, continuing to improve. So. There's plenty of good teams around, but I think we're definitely a shot at winning it this year, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And the Australian, and because we're hosting America uh, in a couple of weeks or three weeks or whatever, um, do we have to go back to uh, America? No, we win it, they're out, and we go through. Um, 
and depending on who we play, who we get in the draw will depend whether we play home or away in the next round. Yeah. Um, so there's no sort of it's not like soccer necessarily where there's like a home and away leg. Um, it's uh, so next time we play the USA, whether it's next year, the year after, or in four years' time, we'll go back to the USA. Um, so yeah, it's a home tie for us, and if we win, we're through. How do they decide that? It's um, originally I think it's toss of the coin. And then after that, once you've played them once, so before you had it played the first time, we had played them in America. The next time we come back, we play them in Australia. And then it's just um, vice versa, go back and forth every time. Oh, okay. So it's our turn this time. Yeah. So the next time we play the States will be in America. So, but it's not necessarily like the same leg kind of thing. No. It's, it's, um, be, it can be like four years yeah. from now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, yeah, that's an interesting, um, proposition because in soccer as you mentioned is quite different the UEFA Champions League in Europe what they do is they have a home and away leg uh, these are for like the top top teams in Europe yeah. so like Manchester United Barcelona Real Madrid etc um, they you know they have like home and away matches and they also have an away goal rule as well where if you um, score a goal at home or or a, or a way, sorry, uh, I don't know. I'm getting mixed up, but um, there's quite a few rules involved. To yeah. uh, whereas with the yeah. Davis Cup, you just have, play in one country. Do you yeah. think it's a little bit unfair in a way? For instance, uh, Australia has the, Australia would have a real advantage against America. Yeah, no doubt. But I think that's sort of the way tennis is. You get your draw, and if it's bad, it's bad. If it's good, it's good. Um, the American team, no doubt, if they can get through, if they don't get through, they'll end up getting a good draw at some point. So, sort of all comes back to even out in the end. But um, it's the same with our Fed Cup team. Australian Fed Cup team last weekend played in Slovakia against Slovakia and managed to get over the line with a 3 2 win. So, they'll come back to Australia and I think they play, I can't remember who it is they play, but I think in about April they played the second round of the, uh, the Fed Cup. So, that was pretty exciting for the Australian girls to get up and have a win. Um, and yeah, similar to the, the boys, they're certainly building a good team with, I think we saw Dasha Gavril over in the Australian Open put on a pretty impressive run and hopefully she can jump into the team in the next, for the next tie and we'll have Sam Stoza, um, Casey Galakwa coming back from injury. So yeah, that team's starting to come, come together pretty well as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I was just thinking of, the, of another idea where you could possibly, say if it was America and the USA, you could probably go to like, I mean, America and Australia, you can probably go to like a neutral country, but if you did that, then you wouldn't have like the proper atmosphere of actually supporting yeah. the, the atmosphere players. probably wouldn't quite be the same if you took Australia and America to England, and it wouldn't be. Nah. This wouldn't be the same. I think the way the way it is, it's sort of it's understood how it works. Everyone's happy with it, and until it's necessary for change, I don't think I'll be changing anytime soon. Hmm. And um, but it's different for obviously single players. Um, because you know they just come up, kind of compete at you know any tournament. Roger Federer's fan base is absolutely huge. I thought I think we embrace him as Australia's own in a way. Yeah, I, think, um, I think anywhere Roger Federer goes, I think the crowd follows him. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think pretty much yeah, anywhere he goes, he'll be stopped in the street, no matter where where he is in the world. So I don't think that'd be an issue for him, but it's probably more an issue for the competition itself. Mm. But there was a story once where um, he could have become an Australian tennis player. I'm not sure if you've heard the backstory of yeah, that. Yeah, I have heard rumours about I don't know the exact story, but I have heard rumours yeah. about that. Yeah. I mean, there was some, something to do with family that might have got him into being an Australian player, yeah. which would have been a fair bust for Australia and certainly would have uh, had Australian tennis going pretty well for a, for a long time with Le Leighton Hewitt and Roger Federer teaming up. But, yeah. yeah, obviously that didn't work out, and he's one of the Swiss all-time greats. Yeah, I mean, he's a Switzerland player through and through, but he's my favourite player, like, even um, aside from the Australian players, I'd, I'd say I'd like him more. Um, just because, you know, growing up, he was, su he was such an awesome player to watch, so dominant. It's like, you know, you're attracted to the very best players, but just the way he played, like you could tell you were watching not just a good player, but you were watching like a like a genius on court. I think one of the posters that they, they, they have the Swiss they go, Shh, genius on court. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a class act on and off the court and I've got a bit of a story about Roger from the tournament. 
Um, he was practicing one afternoon. It was late in the tournament, just towards the semi. Might have even been the. No, I think it was about the quarterfinals. Um, he was playing a night session match, and he was practicing on show clock two in the afternoon before a match started. I can't remember who was playing. It might have been the, a doubles match started. It started a bit late or something. Anyway, he came out with his coach Ivan Lubicic and practiced. And um, we had our sixth ball kids ready to go on call for the start of the match. That was to come after him. And as he came off the court, um, most players probably would just walk straight past the kids and not barely even acknowledge him. But Roger, as being Roger, walked past and said good day and said how are you going and uh, had a chat with the kids. So I thought that was a massive thrill for those kids and certainly something Roger is just shows all his class, no doubt about that. Yeah, just on and off the court, um, and that's yeah, and that's another bonus of Federer. It's not just he's like a great player one of the best ever, but, you know, he's such a a great role model um, for tennis, you know, even though he's not number one, I mean, he's won, he's won a lot of sportsmanship awards. Uh, Plus his 90, uh, 90 singles titles or something ridiculous like that in the, uh, in the last 15 years, 20, almost 20 grand slams, he's been mm. probably the greatest of all time. Mm, I remember uh, an interview for this Australian Open they did with him. And I think one of the rules that uh, you would know about this is that uh, ball boys and ball, girl, ball girls, they can't ask for uh, uh, like photos or signatures with the players. Whereas Roger Federer on video was like, um, oh, you can just ask me, I'm totally cool about it. Uh, yeah. That pretty much sums up his personality. Yeah, it certainly did. Um, it certainly uh, got through back to the kids. There's no doubt about that. They were all pretty excited about that prospect. But um, yeah, unfortunately, um, we can't have them running around getting autographs and photos with the players. Um, it's a bit of an unprofessional look and sort of, yeah, especially in uh, areas where the public don't have access to. So we don't um, don't condone that. But, yeah, that's sort of the class the class over the years and he's always had a bit of a soft soft spot for Australian Open ball kids. I think he's uh, given a few of them YouTube highlights forever. So, yeah, he's a class act. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, you were talking about how, you know, uh, what the public don't see. Um, how about, do you get to see uh, the training methods some of the players have to go through before a tournament? Oh, you don't see them before the tournaments, but you can see, like, before Oh, the no, matches. no, sorry, before the matches. Yeah, you see some bits and pieces, um, like, going through the tunnels and stuff, you might see them doing all kinds of just sort of hand-eye coordinations or not so much sprints but just like sort of run-throughs all that kind of stuff but nothing necessarily out of the ordinary as I would have thought. No, no. Um, but for instance, someone like a Novak Djokovic who's got uh, insane uh, reflexes and just his, um, his movement on court is absolutely amazing. I think it kind of freezes opponents at times. But, um, you know, I've seen him do exercises where, you know, he's... Um, just like, you know, doing some like really uh, difficult stretches and stuff. And I guess that's to get, you know, um, you know, to feel more loose when you're on court because he relies so much on movement. Um, aside from his ground strokes, you know, movement is like a, a key part of tennis, you know, the ability to stay ready to prepare for the shot. Um, even when I played tennis, you know, one of the first things they taught you was with your feet as you're about, and I always see this with tennis players, they always kind of, you know, they always kind of like bounce off their feet a little bit. Uh, do you know what the purpose behind that is? To ready to move yeah. as quickly as possible. Um, Novak's, again, probably the best we've ever seen at that. I think he's, yeah, as you said before, he's moving across the court and his, his ability to read where the ball's going to go and then get to it is as good as anyone's probably ever seen. Um, and his, yeah, his ability to just get every single ball back, it just makes players, it frustrates them, and then eventually they make a bad shot, and Novak wins more often than not. Uh, he probably hasn't got necessarily the biggest serve in the world, but what he does with it is enough, and then he just lets his ground strokes and his rally play do the rest. Mm, and, you know, at the Australian Open especially, um, compared to other hard courts, it's not as quick. And, um, you know, and that's one of the things when, like, he's playing Roger Federer. Roger Federer prefers the grass. I think one of the reasons why 
is because one, his serve, that's one of his most important, probably the most important shot of his game. Oh, probably forehand as well. Yeah. He's pretty good everywhere, isn't he? <laughs> there isn't much that uh, yeah. is bad about Roger Federer's play. He's pretty good. Yeah. Well, he's backhand, forehand, so but, they're all pretty good. Yeah, but whereas if Roger was playing Novak at Wimbledon, he'd have more of a better chance because the movement factor, you have um, less reaction time, you know, and kind of Novak thrives off, you know, having kind of more reaction time to just, you know, get to a ball. Whereas if it was on Wimbledon, he wouldn't have enough time. I think that's one of the reasons why he's been so successful at the Australian Open. Um, yeah, it's a bit quicker than Wimbledon. Wimbledon's a bit slower on the grass, so certainly got plenty of time to um, move around the court. But yeah, Novak certainly thrives in Melbourne. There's no yeah. doubt about that. I mean, he's a six-time champion, equal with equal most of any uh, of all time. I'm pretty confident to say that he could go seven, eight, maybe even ten Australian Open titles before his career is done. He's not that old still. Um, and to have six titles, I think maybe he's 28 now. I reckon he's still got at least probably two more in him. Um, and who knows, we may see a 10 times Australian Open champion, but that's not that's still a fair way down the track. There's nothing about that. There's plenty of young players. I still play. That's what coming up to take his place as number one in the world. Mm. Um, yeah, like you said, like, you know, Warrinka on any given day is dangerous. You know, he beat um, Novak on clay last year. I mean, he's got the game to beat anyone. Yeah, he beat Novak in Melbourne two years ago as well to clinch his first Grand Slam title. So he's certainly a class act as well. Probably, probably been a bit unlucky not to be, to be in this era of just three of the all-time greats in uh, Djokovic, Nadal, and Federer. Mm. Not to have gotten himself a couple more Grand Slams, but yeah, he's a pretty impressive player as well. It makes me wonder whether if Novak Djokovic uh, was present when, say, Roger like when Roger Federer, like during Roger Federer's time when he kind of had like Leighton Hewitt as a rival, uh, Andy Roddick, if that was replaced by Novak, I wonder if it would be the opposite thing. We'd be going, okay, Novak is the best player. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if Novak, Grappa, Andy Murray, Roger were all the same age and went right through together. Mm. It would be an yeah, unbelievable thing, sort of what, they were, what we were talking about as far as who was the greatest of all time, but I think it's fair to say Roger's probably still the greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. And with Leighton Hewitt, um, obviously he holds the record for um, being the youngest world number one in uh, tennis history. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Is that yeah? Yeah. Um, Hold on. What what happened? Do you think though? After he had he still had a good run, like for you know five years or whatever. But after that, he would kind of tail off. Top thirty, top fifty sometimes even outside of that due to injury. Like, what do you think happened? Yeah, it was completely that his body failed him. It failed him so badly that um, I'm surprised he got him got him this far, to be honest. Um, he had, I think he had really terrible feet. He's, he had a lot of foot surgery for probably three or four years. He pretty much had foot surgery just so he could get up and play in the Australian Open. Uh, his body was just shot to pieces and in the last couple of years it's come good and he's managed to get through the last couple of years reasonably well but yeah it's sort of four or five year period sort of late 2000s he really battled with injury um, and as I say it was a pretty impressive effort for him to get through to the 20th Australian Open in a row um, that's also a record um, and don't know whether that'll be beaten anytime soon because I mean he started as a 15 year old so don't think we'll see too many more 15 year olds running around in the Australian Open so probably going to be a record he holds for a long time yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you think, you know, part of his popularity, even though he was an ex extremely successful player um, in his younger years, the fact that I think his mentality as well on court, I think that's uh, there for everyone to see, just how determined he is. You know, even when he was, uh, when we knew he was playing with an injury, he'd just go out and um, <clears throat> kind, of, kind of like grind out the match. And that's what we love, you know, in Australia. I think we always have a, a penchant for... The, the underdog? Yeah, no doubt. I think his, um, his support and his legend sort of grew in the last sort of five years when it was obvious that he was really battling. He was getting a bit older. His game probably wasn't up to the best in the world, um, but he still did everything he could, still worked so hard, still probably worked harder than most. Um, and on the court, his uh, ability to work himself back into a match, I think no matter how many times he looked like he was down and out, 
he'd get himself back and win. Um, I think I think it was Kazakhstan maybe last year in the Davis Cup. He ended up winning a five-set match there. That was just sort of that was probably one of the last ones that he won in that sort of situation that are just unforgettable. Um, there's so many so many instances of Leighton being in a five-set match that or being down two sets to Love and going back and winning a five-set match. And I think that's what Australians have loved about watching him in the last 20 years. And I think, as I say, his last sort of five to ten years of where he's probably battled with injuries. His game's sort of been taken over by Brett Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, the like. Um, but continued to do everything he could. That's what's made him the, probably the greatest Australian of the last 50 years, probably since Rod Laver and the like. Mm. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, he's Davis Cup captain. You know, he's such a great role model for our upcoming players, it's such an important time for Australian tennis because we have, you know, three great uh, male players. I know Tomic's uh, sister, uh, Sarah Tomic, apparently she's going to be a really good player. Yeah, she's starting to starting to come good. She's 17, I think, now. Uh, she's probably going to take a little bit longer than what Bertie did, but, yeah, hopefully in the next five years or so we might see her playing in the Fed Cup for Australia because, yeah. She played. She's played in the last couple of years in the juniors of the Australian Open, and she made a semi-final this year, which is pretty impressive. Um, I think she might still have one more year in the junior, on the junior tour. So hopefully, in 12 months' time, she might be a girls' singles champion at the Australian Open, and then hopefully under bigger and better things in the next sort of five years. Yeah, you could imagine even like a mixed doubles match uh, with uh, Bernard and uh, Sarah Tomic. Yeah, it'd be pretty good to watch. I think both of them, particularly Sarah, actually, she's got quite. You know, she's got, Quite a lot of power. Um, watched a couple of her matches during the tournament. She just blasted girls off the court. Just physically much too strong for them and powerful. So hopefully one day maybe Bernie and Sarah might be mixed doubles champions at the Australian Open. Who knows? But um, yeah, hopefully Sarah might come on and join that Davis Cup team with Gavrilova um, and a couple others who have just sort of got themselves in the last 12 months and build something pretty special for the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and uh, a key part of um, their career has been their, their father. Like, uh, you know, there's been a bit of controversy, though. Um, I think I think he no longer um, coaches Bernard. Uh, I think you're right, but uh, in the Thanks. last sort of little while, he's certainly uh, worked his way back into the tennis, tennis circuit, I guess. Um, I think he was there in Melbourne for the Australian Open uh, watching Bernie's matches, but I think he's certainly taken a back seat and I think he's done wonders for Bernie's tennis on and off the court. Um, certainly still has his, has his issues, both Bernie and his dad, but um, it's probably best that he took a back seat and hopefully that'll um, bring Bernie on in leaps and bounds in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. But I think he's switched, I'm not too sure, I think he's switched over to Sarah now. I yeah, think, yeah, I think he still plays a fairly prominent role in Sarah's tennis. Hasn't seemed to have had so many issues with Sarah, but touch wood that doesn't happen anytime soon. Um, because yeah, both of them are pretty impressive young players, so hopefully they can yeah. play some good tennis for a long time. But there were instances where I watched a YouTube video once where Bernard Tomic asked for his dad to be removed from the court because uh, he's he was making I don't know he was just being annoying or something. <laughs> um, yeah, I think most uh, father son combinations in yeah. sport have issues like that. Um, that's probably why it's not necessarily a great thing with a particular professional level that dad's coaching the kid. Um, but it's certainly worked for Benny for a long time, but I think it's worked out that's probably not going to work for the future. Mm, I think he's got Tony Roach on board now. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but hopefully if he does, that's certainly a good thing because Roach has been around for a long time. He doesn't? I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I might. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. sure I'm that. sure. Even if he's not the official coach, I'm sure that Rochi would have involvement with Bernie, being obviously part of the Australian Davis Cup setup and all that kind of stuff. So, but hopefully he might take a bit more of an involvement with Bernie now that Lane's career is over. Because um, yeah, that'd be a big boost for Bernie, no doubt about that. Mm, because it's, you know, I could imagine, um, uh, you know, neither of us have been like a father, but like, you know, if you're imagining from like a father's perspective, you know, you kind of you're nurturing your son through his tennis career is kind of hard to let go and there's a point 
um, where, you know, especially with Tom Hitch, because Tom Hitch games like really developing and sometimes you can get a bit stale. It's like with any player, you switch coaches. Um, someone like Rafa Nadal, he's had uh, his uncle, Uncle Tony. Um, That's been pretty successful for a long time. Just straight through his whole career. And I think he's now a eight or nine time Roland Garros champion, some ridiculous number like that. I think he's lost one match there in his career. Um, and yeah, that's certainly that relationship's been pretty successful. Um, mm. and hopefully, it'll be good to see Rafa back at his best. It was a shame that he got knocked out round one by uh, Fidasco, but hopefully we can see Rafa back at his best in France and maybe get himself another one of those titles. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, it was kind of you know sad seeing him you know uh, bumming out of the first round of the Australian Open this year. I think I I, I wasn't surprised. I I, I Vidasco is a good player. Mm. Um, and he's not one of the best, but he can play very well. And in the Australian Open, he had a five-set match with um, Vadasco before, which yeah, Nadal won. Yeah, a long time ago. That was one of the more memorable uh, semi-finals. I think it was 2009. They went to all hours of the night. It was four or five-hour match, something like that, in the semi-final. Oh. And it was, yeah, unbelievable. But it was a shame then Vadasco beat Nadal around one and then I think mm. can't remember who he played, he played some lowly ranked player and got beat in the second round. So in five sets I think. Yeah, yeah. that was a shame. But anyway. Um yeah and, and, and just just going back even though it was a long time ago, the two thousand nine match that was one of the, the best matches I've ever watched. Yeah. Uh, between Rafa and um Fedasco. I mean that was such an amazing match because yeah. they were both left handers. Nadal was kind of in his prime, you know. Yeah, it was in, Nadal at his best, 2009, about that. Yeah, it was just, you know, he's such an athlete, but I think, like Hewitt, there's a point where your body kind of starts to break, you know, yeah. you can't. Um, I think Nadal's starting to get to that point, unfortunately. He's, I don't think he played for memory last year, and that was because of injury, and he's got more injuries, and he's dealing with them, but hopefully we can see him back at his best fairly soon. Absolutely. Well, uh, Josh, I'd just like to um, thank you just for uh, creating, you know, uh, like an amazing uh, tournament, not just you, but just like the whole um, kind of management side of it. Um, the Australian Open 16 was such an awesome tournament to watch. Um, and yeah, I'll make sure I have you on when the, um, especially when the Australian Open 2017 is about to start. Yeah, we're already in preparations. We're four weeks away from our first trial from Bullkids, so not far away from the preparations beginning for Australian Open 2017, and we can't wait for it to start again. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, thanks, Josh, for coming by. No worries. Thanks, mate.